here, um, but to do a so brief introduction. So Lane is the Senior Director of Production Engineering at Fastly. Uh, she's a database professional with extensive and, proven, extensive and proven knowledge of how to grow and sustain da database infrastructures and persistence tiers for highly available and successful web applications at scale. That sounds like She's <laughs> <laughs> That is your provided bio, by the way. <laughs> she supported organizations such as Obama for America, Activision, Call of Duty, EchoSign, Adobe, Disney Mobile, Trevelocity, and Technorati. She is an advocate for distributed architecture and systems, the culture of DevOps, and open source solutions wherever possible. Uh, Charity Majors is the CEO and co-founder of Honeycomb, the world's first truly next generation analytics service. Charity previously ran operations at Parse and Facebook, managed a massive fleet of MongoDB replica sets, as well as Redis, Cassandra, and MySQL. She worked closely with the RocksDB team at Facebook to develop and roll out the world's first Mongo Rocks deployment using the pluggable storage engine API. So please join me in welcoming Lane and Charity. Yourself and what you're up to these days. Okay, um, let's see. You've said a lot of stuff already, but uh, so I'm at Fastly right now, which is awesome because I have a job that involves almost nothing to do with databases at all. So it's pretty chill because databases are the hardest things. So this is um, working on all the production engineering things, observability, uh, configuration management, automation, enabling everyone else to do better jobs at what they do. Um, living in Vegas, which is horrible because it gets up to like 40 Celsius and there's scorpions in my house. And uh, so I'm about to be in Ireland because there are no scorpions. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good thing. I live in Texas and yes, I have scorpions at my house as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Charity, Honeycomb, new venture for you. Why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it was a part we acquired at Facebook. And um, some of the tooling techniques that I learned there legitimately changed my life. I was a better engineer with them. I decided I never wanted to live without them anymore. When I quit, um, I figured my brilliant strategy was I will build the tool that I need, I will make it all, I will source it, and I'll never have to live without it again. Uh, but we keep stubbornly not failing, um, which is fine too. And this is why I ask people where they found companies. <laughs> because people were like, how's it going? And I'd be like, oh god, it's the worst, everything's terrible. And then I realized I'm trying to sell to them, and that's not very reassuring. So I've been banned from selling. There's other experts for that. Yes. <laughs> You've been banned from selling and I've been banned from root access. <laughs> <laughs> Our experts. <yes. laughs> um, so, you know, I guess, so, you know, one of the questions I would have based on your here, why is it especially hard to run reliable databases at scale? Well, it's just the failures are more catastrophic. You know, you, this is why networking has never been fun to me. Like, you drop some packets, you're like grains of sand, I mean, who the fuck cares, you know? Data people care. It puts people in and out of business. Yeah, and when you try automation, you know it's very different when you can spin up Nginx instances and you know very quickly at container speed. But building a database replica and auto scaling it takes a long time, so it's very different. It, the difficulty <coughs> is not linear. <laughs> it's a step function. It's way harder when you're trying to do it. You know, a, a larger than one instance or one availability zone or one region. And even though people are always losing data, actually telling them they're losing, they could potentially lose data really They get scary. very upset. They don't understand that they're losing it. They just don't know. <laughs> uh, so the argument, uh, one of David's questions that he had here was uh, the argument that today database people are really engineers and not operators. Um, how has the DBA role evolved since the days of one DBA maintaining 10 servers um, to, the, to the DB org? So in my mind, you're an engineer if you write code and you build things. You're not if you don't, you know? And none of us um, anymore are allowed or supposed to be operators. We all have to build things, even if we're building scaffolding, you know, even if we're building stuff around the software. I completely, I completely agree. I think that, you know, we're all <coughs> engineers and um I'm gonna say something before I just went off like all the time. <laughs> um, I think that's a part of it. And in general the DBA job has shifted tremendously. The part of it is we have to do have to code, we do have to build those things. Uh, part of it is we have to start uh, connecting more to other organizations. We can't be the superheroes who swoop in 
put an index in and disappear. You know, the things we do uh, are force multipliers, but we have to collaborate, we have to get into the development systems, we have to get into source code, we have to get into the CI CD pipelines. Yeah. Um, and by doing that, we can, that's the only way the database engineer can scale, right? Because the teams are large. Snowflakes, you know? <laughs> it, it, you don't want a snowflake um, person any more than you want a snowflake like instance. Um, they should be stamped out and eradicated. We don't want to be eradicated, so we need to like move with the time. So, you know, one of the other questions I had then, sort of tagging onto that, is, you know, what are some, what are the, some of the trends that you are seeing nowadays? I think the biggest one is the, the dawning realization for all of us that, you know, the generalist software engineer is where the center of gravity is moving. Um, people and DBAs were never going away. Um, I feel like this is why QA people just kind of vanished <laughs> many years ago, because they didn't move at the time. They didn't realize that. All of us who are not, you know, in the in, in the spot of the generalist, um, we exist mainly to be force multipliers, like they said, um, to make um, the work have more impact. And if that sounds like I'm diminishing it, I'm really not. It's more that like um, your ops team uh, is increasingly uh, behind an API. You know, it's made up of fascinating ops people and AWS ops people and um, all these services that you know, the, the general software engineer kind of combines. And this is why when we talk about the sector of DevOps, you know, way one was, okay, ask people, time to learn to code, you know? And then phase two, which I feel like we're only a, a couple years into is, all right, software engineers, you need to know how to operate your own fucking services, you know? Operability and observability, you might not be doing all the work. No one's saying that you have to be the only person doing it all, but you have to understand how to intelligently combine components. Yeah, and with that, we we increasingly, increasingly become uh, sort of islands of expertise that either we work in a company, a startup, or an organization that is utilizing a lot of these services to share the about, in which case we're going to be one of a few people uh, who have the expertise and who are having to continuously integrate broader, more broadly in the organization, or we're going to be the people running those systems, and it's going to be more yeah. like going to work at the electric company than yeah. going to work at a startup. But a glamorous and highly paid electric company. It's true. Good benefits. <laughs> <laughs> a pension. Great benefits. Mm -hmm. Lots of food, coffee. And yeah, yeah, stuff. it's not the worst life. <laughs> <laughs> but it's awesome too for us because honestly, doing this for one company is really fucking boring. You know, building a widget for one company is really boring. Building it for a category, like solving a category, that's exciting for people like us, right? That's what it was like at Parse. We were in a million apps before our like, Parse was shut down. When I left. Um, at Honeycomb, you know, I don't want to go be getting like, acquisition offers from the beginning. I don't want to be someone's in-house, you know, puppy. Like, I want to sell this for everyone. That, that's what's exciting and fun and thrilling when people like us are gravitating. One constant in Palomino when I was hiring DDAs to, you know, to work is they were excited about being able to work on multiple projects with multiple companies and that you know being a DBA, if you're a good DBA you tend to automate yourself out of a job mm -hmm. and you end up then just doing the crap work or waiting mm -hmm. for the incidents to happen and so they enjoyed the fact that they could go into a company like Palomino or Percono and you know support all of these different projects learn different things constantly grow yeah there's never going to be a shortage of hard problems to solve yeah. so Larry Ellison lied when he said the DBA is going away just me taking <laughs> yeah. It's just a, it's it's just like like the doctor who's getting being reformed, they're regenerating. <coughs> well, I think that's a good point. I mean, every everything has to continue to evolve, and, mm -hmm. you know, including these jobs and the mm -hmm. systems and stuff. So, um, so one of the the questions that I was warned, Charity, that might set you off was, how does observability differ from monitoring? I have no idea what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm firmly opposed to rants of all sorts. Um, so I, I do think this is important, and I think that you know people get their feathers ruffled, and it's fine. Um, but it's a distinction that's becoming increasingly relevant because monitoring, there's a whole set of best practices and things that we've learned um, that are still true. Like you shouldn't have to stare at graphs all day; it should notify you when it's building. You know, so you go investigate. All these things are still true, but it does not encompass the, t the total sum of everything that we need to do with instrumentation. I think of monitoring as as the part that cor corresponds to operating the complex service. You know, um, you you can see how it's going to break, or you see how it breaks over time, and you write alerts, you write checks or something to very quickly, you know, zero in on those things. 
But observability is more about how do you answer questions? You know, sometimes they're business questions, they're support questions. And oh my god, if you think that you should get an alert every time something happens, uh, uh, you've never worked on a sufficiently large or complicated system, or you're killing yourself, you know, and those around you. Um, like observability, monitoring is, I think, a subset of observability. And observability is, is like, it's about instrumentation. You know, like, I think of instrumentation as being, this is how you write software. Monitoring is how you operate software. Observability is like the umbrella question of how do you understand what's going on inside your system. It comes, the term actually comes from control theory, and it's about can you understand the inner workings of, of the system by examining its outputs. That's it. You know? And I feel like if we dilute the term monitoring too much, then we get all of those best practices confused as well. No, monitoring is a thing. There's a lot of overlap between all these things. But observability is a broader question of, we have this incredibly complicated thing that lots of people depend on. How does everyone understand what's going on? I concur. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <everybody. laughs> So does anybody in the audience have any questions for, for Elaine and Charity? Anything you've been dying to ask them? All right, then I will continue to ask questions. Um, so what was your experience writing, writing the book together? What sort of- To I mean, be clear, the whole Lane thing? wrote almost all of it. <laughs> Charity's marketing. I planned on writing some of it, and then I started a company, and I just- no, it's okay. We, we would occasionally do uh, sort of mind melds and verify that we were still strategically aligned, as I would say, in an executive meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's, it was nice because I had just sold help, you know, and so I had time on my hands and I was depressed, of, you know, still in business and my father had passed and I didn't have a job, so I drank a lot of wine and I played video games and I wrote a book. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good plan. Right? Fine, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, it still took forever. It still was very challenging. Um, I feel like I'm at that phase right after the baby's born where you're like, no kids ever again. <laughs> and maybe next year I'll change once I forget how horrible it was and do it again. Um, I think we should talk about the title because we argue about that a lot. Because yes. it's originally going to be called the Data Database and Operations Book. Yes. You know? And, and at this point, neither of us never heard the term DVRE, but, but we were like, you know what? Database Operations is. Like they were saying, this is not the future. This is not what we need to be getting excited about and challenging ourselves on being, you know, future thinking about. And so we we call it database reliability engineering. And the more I think we made a great decision. You know, I really like it. I mean, this is the way that I want to think about data people in the future. You know, it's like you know they're like 75 percent operating as overlapping at SRE team. You know, 50 75 percent. That means they share tools and share processes and they share culture you know, with the SREs or the DevOps or whatever the kids are doing these days. Uh, and that's, I think, how you become a real pillar of an organization is it's growing and being transformed. Yeah, we even thought of calling in DevOps for DBAs. Oh, we did, ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then I realized DevOps should only be in your job title if you want the increased salary that comes with having DevOps in your title. Um, <laughs> but the reality is databases have to be part of reliability culture, right? Operations doesn't always have to be a reliability engineering job, and I don't like conflating the two. And operations has a huge place in any organization that is operating software and infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, but databases, by their nature, have to be part of the reliability engineering culture that you know has been evolving, that Google has been espousing and other folks. And so yeah, I agree. And I honestly hate the term SRE. I refuse to call it SRE. I don't like it because it reduces everything that we do to reliability. It sounds to me like I just I'm supposed to maintain shit that other people wrote and like keep it like coming along. No. Try not to like get too angsty about words, but I'm an angsty person. Um, but I do like like if anyone is supposed to be focused on reliability, it's database people. And like there, I think it's super appropriate. Yeah. There's still opportunities to take measured risks for the business around your data, but they should be much more infrequent and much uh, more carefully measured. Yeah, and you need to be more intentional about your backup plan. You know, like I, I wrote a written blog post or two of uh, criticizing people who showed up and were like, MongoDB sucks because I did this. I upgraded and flipped the primary and new storage engine in two days and it didn't work. Fuck MongoDB! And I'm like, oh, children. Like, 
can we talk about rollback strategy? <laughs> can we talk about a vacant period? Can we talk about all these things that you do before you blame the vendor? <laughs> Unless it's Reddit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Reddit is not a database. That's true. It's a cache. Container database. Yes. <laughs> so, so where do you see the SRE concepts? Where do you see those evolving? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it more. Yep. <laughs> SRE concepts. Um, honestly, I think that um, two things are happening at once, right? There is um, more and more um, consolidation into generalists. Generalists are just so powerful. You know, specialists increasingly. It, like ten years ago, when I started doing this, it was like you had all these different specialists. You know, at a very small point of overlap, and there were these different worlds. You know, and silos that are were honestly created by tooling, where they couldn't speak each other's tooling. You know, it was like you were joining a different company if you switch teams. And and the space that is shared, you know, continues to to grow. And so the more so the more cross-functionally literate you are, the more powerful you are. And it's not that there aren't places for specialists, but if you choose a specialist path, you need either need to go to a big company or a company that's specializing in that thing. You know, and, and I feel like, you know, there's space for those people, but less and less, and you do better and better. And I think most of us embracing just the, the breadth of interesting things that are out there and learning to share, you know, I when I got better at telling people what I was thinking, she says if she stutters, um, I, I became much better at my job, even, even without me getting better at technology, because so much of what's um, locked away in your brains, you know, is really hard to transfer to other people, even if they would love to would hear it. I think that communication, and engineers we, we hate this, but like communication is a core competency for us. And especially for ops and data people where, where we have to get people on board with what we know and what our plan is, or they're not going to do what we're saying that they should do, and everything's going to be terrible. You know? Like communicating and broadcasting is a way, getting people invested so that they quietly carry out your agenda even your back is turned is, is, is really powerful. And then also, I think, um, continuing to become more involved in business outcomes rather than yeah, just the sure. tech work that we love to do. I mean, to the point where, I mean, we have to get to the point where anyone who is uh, doing engineering uh, understands concepts like error budgets and what the business's expectations are, how to tell the business what a risk is and when they should be making it and when they shouldn't. And yeah. you know, too often we get, uh, we still get mired down in the coolness of this project but, versus the outcome. But of I that feel project. like there's 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 a we we hear the word bird business or I do it and my brain just like eh. You're not talking to me, you know, my brain just off. I, I don't like thinking about business outcomes, which is why I have a COO. <laughs> uh, but we all we, we we deeply crave for our work to matter, which is kind of just the way of stating that in terms of understand, right? We get really pissed off if we've worked on something and then it doesn't ship. Or it worked on something and nobody uses it, you know? Um, which is, so, so maybe we just need to get better at using the right language to explain to people your work matters, you know, when it makes the business better. So just like translate the terms a little. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. Um, you know, it's uh, the words, the language does matter, and especially if you want people to hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um, which is why I, I think the, the title you chose is better than the one you rejected for this. <laughs> Data, so, databasing for fun and profit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what is the the one reason you would tell somebody why they should buy this book? Because we want the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you get yeah, rich. When, you first. get rich when you write books. Let me tell you. And so many dates. Uh, when I tell people I wrote that book. Oh, yeah, hot shit. Hot shit. <laughs> um, I would say, so the book's a framework. And someone was asking me this yesterday after the talk. Um, this book is a framework. And it's an interesting position in that it's not the most technical book in the world, but it explores very technical things. Uh, but I chose this book um, to write this book because at Palomino, we have a lot of old school DPAs. And I could tell that they needed to sort of catch up and learn some things if they wanted to continue to have fulfilling careers that paid their bills and put their kids in college and all of this. And so a lot of this book is geared towards 
um, experienced people uh, who, needed, who you want to explore a new paradigm with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also geared towards uh, senior software engineers, operators, people who may yeah. not know databases that Accidental well. Accidental DBAs. Yes. Um, so there's something for everyone in it, uh, but I think particularly if people are looking at uh, a new a new framing of how to, how to do their jobs or how to hire new folks or how to bring new folks into this paradigm if they want to be mentors you know senior engineers whose job it is to is to you know to bring other people up to senior quality that's why they should have the book. I've never actually worked with a DBA. I've just always accidentally like been responsible for the data pretty much every place that ever worked. Which is why it was really fun to write this with Lee, because she comes from the perspective of the DBA, you know, and I'm just like dabbling in it for 10 or 15 years. For I learned my DBA on the streets. There you go. <laughs> Between hurricanes, <laughs> both that kind and that kind. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, the book signing is going to be after the keynotes um, uh, in the exhibit hall area, so again, Get your get your copy and get it early. Get your copy. They've been yeah. running out very fun fast. And, yes. Fun and profits. That's what they're fun looking for. Yeah. <laughs> and if, even if you don't manage to grab a book, I'll have tons of Vasily swag too. So okay. come get the swag. I have to grab my stickers. <laughs> I'll bring some later for my for my talk in the afternoon. I'll bring some stickers. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Lane. Thank, Thank you, Terry. <laughs>